Welcome to day 34 of our scripture reading and Bible encouragement. Today we're going to cover Leviticus 4, 5, and 6, as well as Matthew 25, 1 through 30. So as we pick up in Leviticus, God is still laying out the different types of um, offerings that have to be done when sin is committed. In Leviticus 4, he's talking about an offering for sins that you're unaware of, sins that you've uh, you've committed uh, you know unintentionally. And and I talked yesterday and maybe the day before about how this is a time that we need to be very thankful for Jesus and the ultimate sacrifice he made for us. But I want to be careful. Just because Jesus made that sacrifice for us doesn't give us a license to sin. So as I'm reading this in Leviticus 4, I'm just reminded that we should be striving hard not to sin. There are sins that we unintentionally commit, just like these people, these Israelites did, and God had laid out a plan for that. We have Jesus for that, but we should always be looking, striving hard not to sin, and looking for where we are making mistakes so that we can be repentant, so we can change and not continue to do that sin. In chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Suppose you sin by violating one of the Lord's commands. Even if you are unaware of what you've done, you are guilty and will be punished for your sin. And this description, it just seems like an impossible standard of living. Um, it must have been very tough for them. and It puts just an incredible um, burden on them to live a perfect life. And I think once again, this does show us so much why we need Jesus. Again, Jesus is not a license to sin. And we have to be constantly looking at where we need to change. But praise God, we don't have to live under this strict law that was almost unattainable. As we flip over into Matthew, Jesus has just come off saying, here's some signs of when I'm going to be coming back. You need to keep watch. You need to be ready. And he gives a parable and he compares the kingdom of God to the parable of ten bridesmaids. And he basically says there's there's ten bridesmaids. There's five. Uh, they all had lamps. They're all waiting for the bridegroom to come for the celebration. So that would represent 10 Christians waiting on, um, you know, Jesus to come back. And it says five were prepared with, with extra oil, but five of them were not. So the, the groom was a little later than intended. And they all fell asleep. And when the groom came and it was announced, they woke up. And the five that weren't prepared, that didn't have enough oil, had to leave and go buy oil because they didn't have enough. But the five that were prepared went straight into the celebration with Jesus, with the bridegroom. And when the five came back, they were turned away. And, and Jesus said, I, I don't know who you are. And what this is representative of, or in other words, you can't wait till the last minute when Jesus comes and then say, oh, now I'll follow you. That's what this represents. It represents that five of them were ready, waiting for Jesus. They were prepared. And five of them were basically just kind of getting by, but not completely prepared. And when Jesus came, the five that were that were ultimately prepared were rewarded. So we have to be careful. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> we cannot fall into this mentality that we'll wait until Jesus comes and then say, now I'll follow him. He expects us to be following him, obeying him, and being prepared for when he does come. And then he jumps right back into another parable. And this is a parable of the three servants. And he says the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the by the story of a of a man going on a trip, and this man entrusted three of his servants. And I love this parable. He says he takes one servant and gives him five bags of silver. One translation calls it talents, which was a which would have been monetary, not necessarily your talents that you're good at. Even though I believe this parable represents those things, it was talking about giving him five bags of money. And then he gives another servant three bags of money. <clears throat> and then finally, the final servant, he gives one bag of money. The servant with five bags invests and gets ten back. And when the master comes back, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've get, you, I gave you five, you invested it, you gave me five back, so you, you ten total, and he was rewarded. The servant that had three bags invested those three bags and got three extra, so he had six total. And once again... The master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, I want to point out here, one servant was given more than the other. One was entrusted with more than the other. But they both got the same reward when they both did the same thing. They both invested what they had. They used what they had, no matter what level. 
and, and the master, who is Jesus, was pleased with that. But then he comes to the one he gave him one bag to. And that one says, I knew you were a, a harsh master. And so I took and I dug a hole and I hid the one bag because I didn't want to lose it. And the master comes back and says, basically, you are evil. He, 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 he tells him, he says, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops, I didn't plant and gather crops, I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest. And then he ordered that that money be taken from the, the servant that had one bag and given to the servant who had produced the most. This is a very, very important parable. This is basically describing the spiritual gifts and the talents that Jesus gives us. He does expect more out of some of us than he does out of others, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much we're given. It doesn't matter how much is expected of us. We are expected to take what we have, use it, and we will be rewarded with more. And in this case, the one who worked the hardest, the one who had the most and invested the most was actually rewarded by getting the talent or the spiritual gift, so to speak, from the one who did nothing with it. In chapter 25, verse 29, it says to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given to them, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know what the weeping and gnashing of teeth is, but it doesn't sound good to me. But I think, again, I just want to reemphasize and encourage you. What Jesus is saying is that we all have gifts. He's given us all gifts and talents and responsibilities. And he expects us to do something with it. I think so many times the gospel is taught as, yes, over in Leviticus, the rules and the laws and the sacrifices were so tough. We need Jesus because we can't, we can't live up to that standard. But then we, we go to the other extreme and we think that we can get away with doing anything. And what Jesus is saying is, no, you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared for that moment that I come back like a flash of lightning. You need to be prepared. You need to take what I've given to you and you need to invest it. You need to do more. So if Jesus has given you a spiritual gift, use it. That's what he's saying here. If you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, you don't know what your talents are for God, please let us know. We will help you find that. We will help you find what your gifts are. I'm, an, I'm a living example of when I first found out what my gifts are, I didn't have very many gifts. But the more I used my gifts, the more God gave to me. And I think about the time in my life when I had gifts and I didn't use them and he was taking them away and giving them to other people. So I've lived both sides of this. And I see the glorious side of using the gifts that I've been given, using the talents I've been given. And God just continues to reward me with more. So that's my encouragement for you today. We are are always, yes, Jesus did come to be that ultimate sacrifice so we don't have to do all these sin offerings we're reading about in Leviticus. But he expects us to do something with what he's given us. That freedom he's given us, we're supposed to do something. We're supposed to take our spiritual gifts and use them, take our talents and use them, discover what they are and use them so that one day you'll hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I hope you were encouraged today and I hope you have a great day.